Hello everybody and welcome to this video about the mass spectrometer and isotopes for A-level chemistry. In this video I will be talking about subatomic particles and isotopes and I'll also be talking about the time of flight mass spectrometer as well. Now this video is part of a larger video that is the whole of atomic structure at once. What I've done though is I've separated it out so it's more kind of bite size but what I've done as well is I've added on the high resolution mass spectrometer. So it is slightly different to the version in the full topic for atomic structure because it's got this extra bit on it too. If we move on now to have a look at how many fundamental particles there are in atoms or ions, depending on what we're looking at, we need to have a recap of how we can use the periodic table to help us do this. So remember, all elements have got their own symbol, and then they've got some numbers. Every element's got two different numbers. The numbers are called the atomic number, and that is given the symbol Z, and we've got the mass number, which is given the symbol A. Now, the atomic number is the number of protons in an atom and the mass number is the number of nucleons that means the number of things in the nucleus and so it is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons so it's the sum of those two values so if we have a look at fluorine down here in terms of protons fluorine will have nine now we said on the previous page that for atoms the number of protons and the number of electrons is the same so that 9 will be for both of these. Zinc will be exactly the same, 9 protons for fluorine, 30 protons for zinc and 30 electrons as well. Where we'll get some differences over here for sodium because that 1 plus tells us that sodium is an ion and more specifically it is an ion because it has lost 1 electron and so what that means is it's got 11 protons because that's its atomic number but it will only have 10 electrons this time because it has lost one if we have a look at neutrons the neutrons is the total number of protons plus the number of neutrons so if we've got nine protons in fluorine here and we've got an atomic mass of 19, a mass number of 19, then the number of neutrons can be found by doing 19 take away 9, which is 10. And we can do 65 take away 30, which is 35 neutrons. And here the number of neutrons is 23 take away 12, uh, 11, which is 12 on there. So the neutrons is the atomic mass number take away the atomic number over there, the big number take away the small number on there. We're going to have a look now at some more complicated particles called isotopes. Now isotopes are particles that have got the same number of protons but different numbers of neutrons. And so I've got some examples here for us to work out. So the protons in these substances, nice and easy, six for all of them because the atomic number is six every single time. The electrons is also six for every single one of these, and the neutrons this time is going to be different. 12 take away six is gonna give us six neutrons for this one. 13 take away six is going to give us seven neutrons on here, and 14 take away six is going to give us eight. If we have a look at bromine down here, bromine has got 35 protons in both cases. It's got 35 electrons in both cases, and this one is going to have 44 neutrons, and this one is going to have 46 neutrons on here. Now, a really important thing about isotopes is their reactivity. And actually, reactivity is governed by the one particle which isn't mentioned in the definition of what isotopes are, which is electrons. And the fact that these three isotopes of carbon have all got the same number of electrons, the they will react in the same way chemically irrespective of the fact that they're slightly different masses on there and the same would be true for the bromine those two bromine atoms would react in the same way because they have both got 35 electrons we're going to move on now and have a look at the mass spectrometer which is almost a separate section but i've put it all in one video 
So a mass spectrometer is a machine, and it's a machine for measuring, because it's got the word meter, or part of the word meter at the end, and that's a clue that it's measuring something. And what it's measuring is the mass of a particular atom or a molecule. And a mass spectrometer is very, very, very accurate. And so it gives us a very precise relative atomic mass. And so the first thing that it can measure is it can measure the relative atomic mass and it can measure the relative molecular mass for a particular substance, which is really useful. The second thing it can do is it can identify a particular element from its relative atomic mass value because most elements have got a unique relative atomic mass and so if you know something's relative atomic mass you can be pretty confident about its identity, although not always. Just want to take this opportunity to give you the definition for relative atomic mass and relative molecular mass. They're really, really... And what you do to calculate the relative atomic mass is you take the average mass of one particular atom and you compare it to the mass of a twelfth of a carbon-12 atom. So it's a twelfth of the mass of a carbon-12 atom. And then the relative molecular mass is very, very similar. Only instead of it being the average mass of an atom, it's the average mass of one molecule. But we still compare it to the exact same thing. We compare it to a twelfth of the mass of a carbon-12 atom. And we use carbon-12 because it is pretty high isotopic purity, so it's about 99% of all carbon is carbon-12, and so we can be quite confident in our comparison, whereas other isotopes have got a far more mixed um, proportions on there. So it's really important to know that we're comparing it to a carbon-12 atom, and because carbon-12 has got a mass of 12, what we're doing is we're comparing it to a twelfth of the mass of one of those atoms, because that allows us to get our value of 1 if we take a twelfth of the mass of something that's got a mass of 12. Now, what happens in the mass spectrometer? It depends on the mass spectrometer that you're looking at. What you need to know for your A-level course is a time-of-flight mass spectrometer, which has got four main steps. And the first step is ionisation, and unsurprisingly, in that step, we make ions, and we need to know that we make positive ions in that step. And I've got a pretty crude sketch of the mass spectrometer, but the sample's injected here, and ionisation happens in this stage on here. So here's our sample, and here's our sample, and then it gets ionised, so it becomes positively charged. Then the ions that are produced all accelerate across the gap. We've got a negatively charged plate over here, and obviously positive things and negative things are attracted towards each other. And this plate over here is fixed, so it can't move. So these ions will drift across the gap on here. And so that's what happens in here. We get acceleration because the ions gain kinetic energy. And they all gain the same kinetic energy. So all ions have the same kinetic energy. And what that means, because they've all got the same kinetic energy, is that the ions that are lighter will travel faster. Because if you push two things, and one's light and one's heavy, the lighter one will move faster. And so stage three, which is where the ions move along the tube, the lighter ones are going to move along the tube with a greater velocity. When they get to the negatively charged plate here, there's actually a gap in that plate that allows the positive ions to pass through. And that kind of focuses the beams that drift along here. And then the final step in the mass spectrometer is the ions hit a detector on here. And as I said, the lightest ones arrive first and the heavier arrive last, and then the detector sends a reading to a PC which gives you your display for your mass spectrum. And what I should say to finish off this little side tube here, this is to a vacuum pump on here, and what that does is that sucks all of the air out of the tube and that prevents our ions from colliding with air and being deflected off the path and never hitting the detector. 
just want to have a look at, in a bit more detail about what happens in ionisation. There are two types of ionisation and you need to be careful when you're answering exam questions, paying attention to which type of ionisation they are asking you about. There is the ionisation caused by an electron gun, which is what was on the old course, and so that you'll find more past paper questions about the electron gun method. And what happens in the electron gun, if you remember the sample has been injected over here, and we've got no charge, no charge, and what happens here is what we've got a filament of wire that is very, very hot, and that is a source of electrons, this hot filament. And what happens is the electrons get fired across this gap over here towards this positively charged plate, and the sample that's moving through the flight tube gets hit by those electrons, and more electrons get knocked off. So we've got our gaseous sample because the sample that passes through the tube has got to be a gas. And we hit it with an electron and that knocks another electron off. So we end up with a gaseous ion and we end up with two electrons because we had one that was from the gun and another one that has been knocked off. Alternatively, you can write this equation slightly more simply by removing the electron from the electron gun and just only writing down in the equation the electron that was knocked off from the sample. Then the second technique is new to the course a few years ago, so you've got fewer questions about this electron spray technique. And this also happens in the early part of the flight tube. And what you've got here is you've got a needle. And so the sample gets injected, but what happens is it gets dissolved in a volatile solvent. and then it's forced through a needle. And as it's forced through a needle, a high voltage is applied. And what that causes to happen is the sample gains a proton. And so what we have here is we've got our sample, which I'm just gonna write as X again, and it gains a proton, and so what happens is we end up with a slightly weird looking thing, which is our sample with a proton joined to it, an H plus joined to it. Um, so it's slightly heavier than before, which is worth noting in a minute. And then last of all, the solvent evaporates to form gaseous positive ions, to form XH plus as a gas. And so the ions have drifted through the tube and they come towards the detector over here. Now remember all ions get the same kinetic energy which means the lighter ions get detected first. They've got a shorter time of flight. That's where the phrase time of flight mass spectrometer comes in. They're detected first. They have got a shorter time of flight. And so the ions are drifting towards the detector, they hit the detector, there's a positive ion hitting the detector, and so what happens is the positive ions pick up electrons from the detector, and that causes a current to flow. Now if we've got a really abundant particular ion, a greater number of electrons will move off the detector and move towards the ions, and so we'll get a greater current. And so our conclusion on here is if we get a larger current, we've got a particular ion or a substance that has got a greater abundance. That means there's more of it in our sample. So what does a mass spectrum actually look like? So we've got two spectra on this slide on here. The first one is showing us one particular um, quality of mass spectra, which is where you have isotopes you get a peak for each isotope that is present. And so these are isotopes of chlorine. And so we have some chlorine, which has got a mass of 35, and we've got other chlorine that's got a mass of 37. And that's coming up on this x-axis as a mz ratio, and that's referred to as a mass to charge ratio. 
and that mass to charge ratio is really quite simply calculated because normally if one electron is removed or one proton is gained that means that the charge is going to be one plus and so if the charge is one plus that means that z the charge is one and so that means that mz is effectively the m mass if the charge is one and so what that means to go back over here is that we've got chlorine with a mass of 37 and chlorine with a mass of 31. Now I've tried to draw these to scale because what we can learn on here is we can track across the abundance and we can find out that 75% of all of our chlorine 35 and then 25% of all of our chlorine is chlorine 37, the slightly heavier isotope of chlorine. Abundances might be a percentage or they might not. It might just be a comparison because 75 to 25 could just be 3 to 1 as a proportion on there. It doesn't have to be a percentage. The second useful thing about mass spectra is shown on this second spectrum down at the bottom. And that involves the peak that is the furthest to the right in a mass spectrum, which is the heaviest peak. The heaviest peak, the one with the greatest mz ratio, is always the uh, molecular ion peak. And so what that means is you've got the whole molecule that has either had one electron knocked off it or it has gained one proton. And so this molecular ion peak is absolutely vital because it tells us what the MR is for a particular substance. So for here, for my made up sample, my made up spectrum, we've got an MR of 112 from this substance. And that can help us to identify what that substance is. Another little quality of mass spectra is we have peaks, not just the molecular ion peak, but we also have slightly lower MZ values and this comes from um, something called fragmentation. And these are peaks for particular fragments of the molecule. And that's because it's particularly common in the electron gun ionization. When an electron gets removed from a covalent bond that's holding two atoms together, we've only got one electron holding the atoms together. And that isn't really enough um, attractive force to hold those two atoms together. So they fall apart into pieces. And one of those pieces will be positively charged. And it's that that gets detected in the mass spectrometer. Let's just explore fragmentation in a tiny bit more detail. It's something I think that you need to have more of an appreciation of rather than be prepared to answer extensive exam questions about it. So here we've got ethanol, which has got the formula C2H6O. Now in the mass spectrometer, the most likely thing that will happen is one electron is going to be removed. And so if this is the case, we would have the molecular ion C2H6O plus, which has lost one electron. Now, what could also happen, though, is that the electron that was removed was part of a covalent bond. And that covalent bond is now no longer strong enough to hold the atoms together. And so what happens is the molecule falls apart. What this means is that some of the atoms might fall off. So potentially this hydrogen atom might fall off or this one might fall off or this one might fall off or any of them really, depending on which electrons were removed. And what we'd end up with would be a fragment ion that would be a little bit lighter. And so instead of C2H6O, the molecular ion, which has got a mass of 46 when it's just lost one electron, we would detect something that had a mass of 45. So really, really similar. What's more likely, though, is that the molecule might break into more significant pieces. So you might get this piece breaking off. And in that case, you would get a CH3 fragment, a methyl fragment, which has got a mass of 15. And I'm working this out, by the way, because it's 12 for the carbon and one for each of the hydrogen atoms. Alternatively, we could get a slightly different fragment. We could get, in fact, the rest of that molecule. So that would be C, 
H3O+. Plus. Remember, everything that gets detected is an ion. And that would have a mass of 12, plus 3 for the hydrogen, plus 16 for the oxygen. So that would be 31. Now, there's other permutations as well, but I think you get the idea. We'll just do one last one. We will break this off into a fragment, and that is C2H5+, plus, which is actually a really common fragment in the mass spectrometer. 12 for each of the carbon atoms and 5 for the hydrogens, which is where we get our 29 from. What I should just say to finish off is that fragmentation occurs when you use the electron gun method for ionisation. When you're using the uh, electrospray method, you're not likely to get fragmentation occurring. Just to look briefly at slightly more tricky mass spectra, the first one isn't really particularly tricky. It's just a notable difference from the previous mass spectrum on the previous page. And this one has been generated using the electron spray mass spectrometer. And so when you ionize using that, remember that what you detect is the gaseous sample that has gained a proton. So you're detecting something with an mz value that is one higher than whatever the MR is. So this 113 over here, that is for the substance with an extra proton, a hydrogen ion, and this hydrogen ion has got a mass of one. So that means that the MR of this substance is actually 113 take away one. Not complicated maths, but you might forget to do it. So you need to take away one from the MZ value when you're working out what the relative molecular mass is for a sample if it's been ionized using electron spray. And that's what I was saying when I mentioned about paying attention to what ionization technique they mention in the question. And then last of all, a tricky mass spectrum could be for when we have a molecule of chlorine. Now this is tricky because there's two atoms in Cl2, obviously, but they could both could have different maths, masses. So they both could be different. They might not be different, but they could be. And so what we could have is we could have, if we consider, say, chlorine atom A and chlorine atom B, chlorine A could have a relative atomic mass of 35. And so could chlorine B. Chlorine A could have a mass of 35. Chlorine B could be 37. Chlorine A, though, could have been 37. And chlorine B could have been 35. And then the last combination that's possible is 37 for both of them. And so what that means is that when we combine those two together, that has got a total mass of 70, that's 72, that's 72 as well, and that's 74. So the mass spectrum for chlorine will have three peaks, one at 70, one at 72, and one at 74. And they won't all necessarily be the same height. In fact, they definitely won't all be the same height in this instance on here. And the reason for that is kind of statistics and, and in maths, that three quarters of all of the chlorine is chlorine 35. So that means there is a three out of four chance that this atom over here will be chlorine 35 and a three out of four chance that this one will be as well. So that means that there is a nine out of 16 chance that they will both be in chlorine 35. The probability that the first chlorine atom is chlorine 35 is 3 out of 4. If the second one is going to be the heavier chlorine 37 isotope, that is not so likely. And so there is a 3 out of 16 chance of this combination. The third combination is the exact same odds, just the other way around. And so that's a 3 out of 16 chance on there. And then the last combination is actually only a 1 in 16 chance that we're going to get that. So if we were to draw these peaks, the chlorine 3737, so the one with an MZ of 74, would not be very high at all. Its abundance would be 1, or 1 out of 16, but I'm just going to call it 1 by taking the first digit in my fraction. The peak at chlorine 72... Because we've got two that combine together, we've got a 6 out of 16 chance that chlorine will be chlorine 72, Cl2 with 70. And so that means that this abundance would be a size 6. And then last of all, the greatest probability, because it's 9 out of 16, well that tells us that it needs to go all the way up to here 
to what would be 9 for the abundance on here. So we would have 3 peaks and the chlorine 70 would be the tallest peak of all, followed by chlorine 72, followed by chlorine 74. It would be, in terms of their abundance, it would be a 9 to 6 to 1 ratio. Let's have a look now at mass spectrum calculations. There's two equations that you need to be able to use, and you'll probably get given them in the exam, but it's worth getting familiar with them in case you don't get given them. And so the first one is the, the equation that you learned at GCSE level, where we're looking at speed equals the distance divided by time. Now, we use the symbol V because what we're really talking about is we're talking about the velocity that these ions are moving through the mass spectrometer, and that is in meters per second. T is the time of flight, and that is in seconds, and D is the distance, that's really the length of the time of flight mass spectrometer, and that is in meters. Ke is the kinetic energy, and that's in joules. Remember, that is the same for all of the ions. That can be really important. V, this is once again the velocity of the ion in meters per second. But then we're going to square it. And then last of all, this m, this is the mass of one ion. And slightly confusingly, it's the mass of one ion in kilograms. So what that means is, if we know the relative atomic mass, what that tells us is the mass in grams of one mole. And so what we then need to do is we need to divide that by a thousand, because that will give us the mass in kg of one mole. And then we need to divide by Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23, because that will then give us the mass in kilograms of one atom, because in one mole there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms, and so we divide by that number to find the mass in kilograms of one atom. It's quite complicated to keep saying that number again and again and again, so Avogadro's number has got the letter L, capital L, if we wanted to use that in calculations. Just by the by, because we're talking about ions, even though it is uh, an ion, that means it's lost an electron, because the mass of an electron is practically zero, that means that we can assume that the mass of an atom is the same as the mass of the ion that it would form. Just a quick note about rearranging these equations. So speed equals distance divided by time. So that means we've got distance divided by time and we've got V on there. And so that is a formula triangle that you'll be familiar with from GCSE level. And then kinetic energy is half mv squared. Some people like to just remember the rearranged formula because they don't like rearranging things. And so that means the velocity is 2 times by the kinetic energy divided by the mass of one ion in kilograms. Now remember, whenever you do one of these calculations, particularly if you're working out time of flight, to do what's called a reasonableness check. And what that means is, does my time seem feasible? Because if I've done a calculation and I've been given the time of flight for one substance and then I'm calculating the time of flight for something else that is heavier, then I need to be aware that the time of flight for an ion that is heavier should be greater than the time of flight for something that is lighter. Um, it might not be very, very different, but it should be heavier. And the numbers are often really quite small. It, it doesn't take very long for the ions to go through this tube. So just be aware that they, the answer is likely to be in standard form and very, very small. The last thing about calculations in the mass spectrometer that I wanted to show you is a shortcut. And that shortcut can be used by making um, several kind of connections between these two equations and between what happens for one isotope and it being the same when we're considering another isotope. The first thing that we need to do is we need to consider the kinetic energy of each of these isotopes. And the kinetic energy is half mv squared for each of them. I'm just using little subscripts 1 and 2 to show the masses of 
the two different isotopes, the masses and the velocities of the two different isotopes on there. So kinetic energy is mv squared for both of them. Now, since it is the same for both, we can merge those together and no longer have the kinetic energy in the middle. Half mv squared for the first isotope is going to be half mv squared for the second isotope. Then I'm going to make it slightly more complicated before making it a lot easier. So if we substitute in that calculation for how you work out the mass of one atom, or one ion, I should say, by taking the relative atomic mass and dividing it by a 1,000 and then dividing it by Avogadro's number, what we're going to end up with is we're going to end up with half times by the relative atomic mass of the first isotope divided by a 1,000 times by Avogadro's number multiplied by the velocity of that isotope squared is equal to a half times by the relative atomic mass of the second isotope divided by a thousand times by Avogadro's number and then the velocity of that ion squared. And then we need to substitute in one last time for v speed is distance divided by time. So when we substitute that in we've got half times by the relative atomic mass of the first isotope divided by a thousand L multiplied by the distance and then the time of flight is on the bottom over there. That T1 is the time of flight for ion number one. And we do the exact same thing for the second isotope. And we're left with an equation that looks really complicated, but it's about to get really simple. Because whenever you've got something on one side of an equation and you've got it on the other that is the same on both sides, we can get rid of it. So there is no point multiplying this number by a half on both sides. So we can get rid of the halves because that's present on both sides. We can get rid of the thousand on both sides because that's the same on both times. And then we can get rid of Avogadro's number because that is a constant, one of the fundamental constants in chemistry. We can get rid of that from both sides. We can also get rid of the D from both sides because both of them, both of the ions, will be passing through the same tube and so they'll be travelling the same distance. And so D will be a constant value as well. So once all those numbers have been taken away, we've got the relative atomic mass of the first ion divided by its time of flight squared will be equal to the relative atomic mass of the second ion divided by its time of flight squared. And so that little box there is a really nice kind of shortcut, memory aid, whatever you want to call it, a way to help you um, work fast, particularly if you're calculating the time of flight for a particular isotope. And that can rearrange, by the way, if you like it in a rearranged form because you don't want to remember something that is hard to rearrange, then the time of flight of the first isotope is the square root of the atomic number of the first isotope times by the time of flight of the second isotope squared divided by the atomic number of the second isotope on there. So that's another form for that same equation. Let's finish this video by considering a couple of last few things about isotopes. So the first thing to consider is something that you will have known for some time, which is that chlorine has a relative atomic mass that is not a whole number. And this is an average relative atomic mass. And what that means is if we had 100 chlorine atoms and we put them all in a box and we found out how heavy they all were together, the total mass of those 100 atoms, and then we divided it by 100 to get our average, the number that we would have is 35.5. But you would not find a single chlorine atom that had a mass of 35.5. What you would find, as I mentioned on a previous page, is that you'd find chlorine that had a mass of 35 and chlorine that had a mass of 37, 17 protons for each of them, by the way. And the abundance of those, as I showed you on the mass spectrometer page, is 75% of this one and 25% of this one. And so what that means is how do we calculate our average? Well, the relative atomic mass is found by taking the abundance of one isotope multiplied by the relative atomic mass 
then we add it to the abundance of the second isotope times by that relative atomic mass and then we divide it all by the total abundance. And if there's more than two isotopes, we just kind of keep going on and on and on for however many that there might be. Three, four, can't imagine there'd be more than three in an exam question, that'd be a bit mean. And so what that means is that we can do a sum where the average mass for chlorine is 75 multiplied by 35 added to 25 times by 37 and then all divided by 100 over there and that gets us our 35.5 as our answer. Now if the abundances aren't given as percentages we do the same thing so 75 to 25 as I said before is a 3 to 1 ratio a 3 to 1 proportion and so the total abundance doesn't always have to be 100% like it is here. The total abundance could be 4, as it is in this instance. And so the sum that we'd do here would be the same principle. We'd do 3 multiplied by 35, and we'd add to that 1 times by 37. And instead of dividing by 100, we'd divide by 4, and we'd get the same answer of 35.5. And good to note, by the way, um, three significant figures or the number of significant figures that you've been given in the question. But if in doubt, three significant figures is a good rule of thumb. And the last aspect of isotopes and their masses is what about if they don't ask you what the average mass is, but what if they give you the average mass? And so you can see here that we've got the mass of iron is 55, but there's another isotope that's got a mass of 56, and the relative atomic mass is 55.8. So that is the average on here. Now, there's two different ways to do this. I'm going to show you the one that I think is the easier way first. And I think it's faster as well. And that seems a bit weird, but I'm going to make a number line. And I'm going to put 55 at one end. And I'm going to put 56 at the other end. And I'm going to divide the rest into 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 chunks. And I'll split it into 10 by dividing it 9 times. And so what we need to do is we need to mark on... 56, 55.9, 55.8 on there. And then how we use this number line is we take steps from one end towards where the average is. So this is the average on here. And we've split it into 10 chunks. And so we've moved 8 out of 10 chunks, 8 out of 10 steps towards 56. And what that means is... 8 out of 10 atoms of iron are 56. So this is 80% Fe56. And if we start at the other end, if we start here and we go 1, 2, we take 2 of the 10 steps towards 55. And that tells us that it's 20% iron 55. Alternatively, if we had a look at the chlorine example from before, we've got chlorine 35 and we've got chlorine 37, and we don't know what the abundance is, but we know that the average is 35.5. We could split it this time. We don't always have to split it into 0 0.1. We split it into whatever makes sense. And so that's 35, then 35.5, that's 36, and that's 36.5. So I've split this into four chunks this time, and the average is here, 35.5. So we've got quarters. We move one quarter of the way towards chlorine 37. And that tells us that one quarter of all of the chlorine is chlorine 37. If we started at the other end, we move one, two, three quarters of the way towards chlorine 35. And that means it is three quarters chlorine 35. Last of all, this question, you could solve this using a number line, but I think it's probably a bit easier not to on this occasion. And so this question would say, magnesium exists as three isotopes, magnesium 24, 25 and 26. The average relative atomic mass is 24.3, as shown there, and they'd give you one fact. They'd say, right, magnesium 26 is 10%. What is the abundance of the other two? Now, to solve that, it's very easy to go down the wrong path in terms of maths. 
and start trying to do a quadratic equation, and I really, really wouldn't do that. What I would do is I would set out the equation as you would expect to set it out. So we've got the abundance of magnesium 24, which we don't know what it is, so we're going to call it x, and we're going to multiply that by its mass, which is 24. And we're going to add that to the magnesium 25. Now, we, this is where you could go down the quadratic pathway by putting a, a y in there and multiplying y by 25 and then adding to that 10 times by 26. That's on the top axis. But what you have to remember is, of course, that percentages add up to 100. And so if we've got 10% of magnesium 26 and we've got X percent of magnesium 24, well, the total is 100. And so this is going to be, and we've used 10, and so this is going to be 90 take away X. We still don't know what X is, but we know that it is going to be whatever is left from 90 once you've taken X away is going to be our magnesium 25. So let me just draw that in a quick pie chart so you can see what I mean. So we've got 26, which is that section, and we've got the rest, which we don't know what it is, but we know it is 90%. And so if we have got 25 and 24, that's going to be X, and this is going to be 90 take away X on there. And then we go back to what we know from before, because we're working with percentages, so we need to divide all of this by 100. What's different this time, of course, is we know what our answer is, so to speak. 24.3 is the average on here. And now we've set up this, our final job is just to rearrange this. And so we've got 24.3 multiplied by 100 is equal to 24x plus 2,250, which is 90 multiplied by 25. Take away 25x plus 260 on there. And then this, of course, gives us 2,430 on the left-hand side. And then this simplifies down to 2,510, take away x on there. And so if we move x over to this side, we've got x equals, and then we take away the 2,430 from both sides. We get 2,510, take away 2,430, which is 80%, which means the percentage of magnesium 24 is 80% up here. If the magnesium is 26 is 10%, that gives us 90%, which means our magnesium 25 is 10% at the end. So we've worked out our two unknowns of 80% and 10% on there. We're going to finish this video off by looking at the little bit of new content. This content isn't technically in the atomic structure topic. It comes in the organic analysis topic, which is the last organic section of year one chemistry, but I think it fits in nicely with atomic structure, so I'm going to put it in here. And this is about the high resolution mass spectrometer. Now before I dive into it, let me explain what high resolution is. What you might not have noticed is that there was a cluster of dots on my screen here, and if I just circle it here just so you can see them. So if I was to ask you how many dots were there on the screen here, you might not be able to tell me the answer. And that's because we're looking at this picture in low resolution. Now, low resolution is less precise. And so high resolution is more precise. And effectively, what we're kind of doing is we're zooming in on the picture. And so we've lost my title there. But we can see, I hope, that there are, in fact, six dots. I'll zoom in a little bit more so we can see that there are six dots on the screen. And so that is more highly resolved. We can tell the difference between those six dots more clearly. So I'll zoom back out and I'll just write that down. That resolution is the ability to differentiate things. So to tell one thing apart from another or in slightly more succinct terms, it is to do with the degree of precision. Let's move on now to explore that concept in a bit more detail and so we can see exactly what I mean by the degree of precision. I think the best way to explore that is through a question. So why do we need a higher resolution? Why do we need a higher degree of precision? 
So what I've got here is I've got a question. What is the MR of carbon dioxide and dinitrogen oxide? The simple mass spectrometers will measure relative atomic masses to more than one decimal point. However, your periodic table will express values for only one decimal point. So if we just explore this question on here, CO2, we've got carbon, which is 12.0, oxygen, which is 16.0, and we've got another oxygen, 16.0. So the relative molecular mass of that adds up to 44 when you add all of those three together. For the dinitrogen oxide, we've got 14 for the nitrogen, and we've got 14 for the other nitrogen, and we've got 16 for the oxygen. So that's 28 plus 16, which is once again 44.0. So these two cannot be told apart. They can't be separated. We can't resolve one from another. And so if we had a container, like this one here, full of particles of a gas, and then we analyzed them using a low resolution mass spectrometer, we might think that there was only one substance in there because we would find an MR of 44, so an MZ of 44 would be detected, and both of these substances have got an MR of 44. So we would think that there is only one substance in this sample. However, some mass spectrometers can measure masses to three, four, or even five decimal places. And this method allows us to work out the molecular formula of the sample with greater precision. It allows us to find out what the MR is for a substance to five decimal points. And so I've got some data here on the left hand side showing the precise AR values, in other words, to not one but five decimal points. What we can see is that carbon 12 is given a precise AR of 12 by definition. Remember, that's the that's how we define the relative atomic mass of a substance. We compare it to a twelfth of the mass of a carbon 12 atom. And so if we've got CO2, carbon really is 12.0000. And then the oxygen is not 16. It's actually slightly less than 16, you'll notice. It's 15.99491. And there are two of them in carbon dioxide. So we need to add all of these three numbers together to get the precise mass of carbon dioxide. Before we even do this, we can have a sort of a reasonableness check. So we worked it out as 44 when we were working to one decimal point. Now that we know that oxygen is slightly lighter than 16, this means that our number should come out to be slightly less than 44. And it does, which comes out as 43 0.98982. So we can see that that is a little bit less than 44. For the dinitrogen oxide, we need to do the same approach. We've got two nitrogen atoms, and instead of nitrogen being 14 like we thought it was, it's a little bit heavier, 14.00643. And oxygen, of course, is one oxygen that is a little bit lighter. So what I would expect here is because the nitrogen is a little bit heavier, and this is on the third decimal point, and there's two of them, and the oxygen is a bit lighter also on the third decimal point, I would expect this value to come out to be slightly greater than 44, in fact. And that's what it does do. It comes out at 44.00777. So this difference really only kicks in on the third decimal point here. So it really is quite close to 44. But overall, what this allows us to do is it allows us to tell these two molecules apart. And so we would see in our substance, if we got some MZ values of 43.98982 or 44.00777, we would be able to say, aha, we have got two substances in our box, not just one. And this approach is in fact used in exam style questions. So let's have a look at one that I've paraphrased here. How could high resolution mass spectrometry prove that a sample of propane gas with the formula C3H8 was contaminated with carbon dioxide? Well, this is the same principle that we were just exploring. We would want to prove that there were two substances by using the high resolution mass spectrometer to see if we get two different MZ values. Now, 
Now to one decimal point, remember these values are still going to be 44.0. And so that's the whole principle of why we need this high resolution mass spectrometer, because three lots of 12 for carbon is 36 plus eight gives us our 44. However, when we look at the high resolution C3H8, we need to take three lots of that 12.0, which is going to be 36.5 zeros. But the eight hydrogen, we need to add on eight lots of 1.00794, which is going to give us a total of 44.06352. So this one is even more different from the one decimal point MZ value, and that's because hydrogen is quite a bit heavier than we think, and there's eight of them in this molecule. So now we've got the MZ value for propane to five decimal points. We can compare it to the carbon dioxide MZ that we worked out in the previous slide, which is 43.98982. Now, obviously, now we have got two different values, which shows that there are two substances in our sample. So we have our propane gas, which is the 44.06352, but we also have something else, which is carbon dioxide's MZ value. So our propane is contaminated. OK, that's the end of this video about the mass spectrometer. There are other chemistry videos on my YouTube channel and it's going to be growing all the time, so I hope to see you on one of those soon. Bye-bye.